Awesome. Let's get the ball rolling. I'll keep admitting folks as they tune in. Well, with that being said, my, my name's Itzel Torres, and I'm with the 3C Run room, with the 3C Run group. I'm working out of Ventura. Today with us, we have Albert Rooks and Eva's in, in the room, too, in the background from Small Pan Planet Supply, and they'll be walking us through the multifamily domestic hot, hot water. Um, before we get started, I just have some slides to walk us through. Next slide. We ask that everybody make sure they are mute throughout the duration of their course. If you would like to verbally participate, please raise your hand in the participant section and we will call on you to unmute yourself, but we encourage you to participate and ask questions in the chat box as well. We'll get to those questions um, throughout either the presentation or we'll have a designated time at the end of the training for Albert to answer those questions as well. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm going to cut up with that. <laughs> Here we go. A little bit of a 3C run. We are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, which is a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. We work on improving energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C Ren is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public's good charge found in our utility bills. Next slide, please. Go on. There we go. There we go. Uh, I think one back. Thank you. There we go. Um, our first program is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering trainings and support to make the energy code easier to follow. Within the Energy Code, code, code Connect program, we offer energy code coach service and over the phone, online, and in the field support for Title 24, Part 6, and Part 11 related questions for both residential and non-residential projects. We also offer online courses and regional forums that are designed to increase overall energy code comprehension, compliance, and enforcement. Next slide, please. Then we have our building performance training program, which is another program where we offer building professionals such as architects, engineers, contractors, and real estate professionals technical and soft skills training related to building science principles and high performance buildings. Next slide, please. And last but not least, we have our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. With that, I'll pass it on to Albert to get us started with today. Thank you. Great. Good. Well, thanks. It's so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, hopefully this will be a, a good uh, use of your time and inform informative session. Um, and the presentation is divided up into chapters. So uh, the chapters at the end of each chapter, I've got a little slide to kind of prompt for some Q&A so we can answer some questions uh, at that point. Questions are great. Um, and um, hopefully I can answer most all of them. Uh, and um, if not, then we'll, we'll kind of do our best. Um, so my name is Albert Rooks. I'm a CEO of Small Planet Supply, which is kind of a parent company. Uh, and we became involved in heat pump water heating, central heat pump water heating for multifamily and commercial applications a number of years ago. Uh, as the CO2 single pass uh, CO2 refrigerant with single pass um, plant design um, uh, became developed over the last few years. And we spent a lot of time doing that. And I'm just quite happy to kind of share what we learned and, and how things work. Um, what the product of, of all of this is lots and lots of research, multi-state multi partners, uh, and then the picture of the fellow there leaning against a heat pump, 
uh, which is actually a two-stage CO2 heat pump that came up for testing. Uh, it was a fellow named Ken Eklund. He led a lot of the research in North America in some of the first CO2 refrigerant designs. Uh, and just a whole lot of stakeholders, a whole lot of studies over the last decade, uh, lots of buildings done, lots of knowledge gained. Uh, and we just, we we owe a lot to uh, kind of our, uh, the people that kind of helped plow the trail in front of us. So in moving from boilers, uh, predominantly in central heat pump designs to, um, in central plant designs to heat pump water heaters in multifamily buildings is really largely the biggest thing about this is it's largely a movement from recovery to primary storage. And, and that's really driven by the fact that, you know, with a boiler, we can just bring in more fuel, add more fuel, more heat to increase recovery and serve some very, very large loads relatively instantaneous. Uh, instantaneously with heat pumps. Heat pumps, you know, are kind of funny. There's a few issues. And one of the issues is just the expense and size and capacity. They'll, they'll typically have a, a much smaller recovery capacity. And while, while you would think that maybe you could deploy a larger heat pump with more recovery onto a building, essentially what you'll find is, is that um, there's also an issue of short, short cycling. And there's a way that we can now understand buildings where we can really kind of lean more on storage and then develop maybe the right amount or a good amount of recovery, work those two scenarios together uh, and create some very efficient systems in how they perform in COP and, and servicing the building, but then also relatively uh, modify the cost. Uh, because storage is a lot less expensive than added heat pump recovery. So the way we approach this is in multifamily buildings, this is a really simple application to look like look at. So we'll we'll kind of start with this application here. Uh, in multifamily applications in in workforce and many types of buildings, there's just really two peaks during the day. And once you start understanding those peaks, then you can really start programming for them. So we start by understanding kind of the load of the building, where the peaks are, what their duration is, what their amplitude is, and in terms of total gallons per day of domestic hot water and gallons, um, and, and what that looks like over the spread of the day. So once we understand that, uh, we can start designing for that. This is what it looks like in two different buildings in Seattle, 708 Uptown, uh, and Sunset Electric, these were both remodel buildings or retrofit buildings. So extensive measurements were done in understanding what the existing load was, and then how that how these buildings performed after they were transitioned over uh, from boilers to heat pumps. It worked out really well, um, and it's really all about understanding that morning peak and sizing storage to serve that morning peak. So this is really kind of what we'll focus on is there's a big load at some point of the day, every building's a little bit different, but we can kind of group them together and classify them into a group um, and, and understand them really pretty well. So essentially, if we have kind of limited recovery, really to serve that morning peak, we want to set recovery that can charge up storage, have that storage available to handle all of that peak, and then see where on the right-hand side, it kind of dips down in the midday usage. We can use that period to start recovering and rebuild the storage. The secondary peak in this building is quite a bit lower than the initial peak, but it's a little longer, right? So we have to kind of understand that characteristic, but there are numbers, right? We can, we can kind of understand what those look like and size. And then with modern systems, I say modern systems, we've only been doing it for, you know, half a decade in, in really these, these really high performing systems, but we're getting a little better and we, with more controls, we can start manipulating kind of the heat pump runtime and adjust the connected load to the building, which is super interesting for retrofit buildings. So in any way, in any case, with controls, lots of storage and, and really efficient heat pumps, there's really a lot we can do. 
But these are the basics. Understand what the building looks like and start approaching the building, working with storage and then recovery to recover that storage. And then it's just kind of a rinse and repeat. So one of the best refrigerants that's come online recently is CO2. We're in a transition point globally where we're trying to kind of transition out of those high global warming potential refrigerants into a low global warming potential or natural refrigerants are really what we like to work with. And CO2 is, is really one of the best. Um, it's one of the best from the standpoint of, yes, it's got a global warming potential of one. CO2 is, of course, how we measure G GWP. Um, but it actually performs really well. We'll look at maybe a little bit of its performance characteristics. This slide is a little bit old, right? These days, there's a big movement to the next refrigerant down, which is not highlighted, propane gas or R290. Uh, it's showing a GWP of 20, but that's actually, um, there are there are new blends that, that have a GWP that's much lower than that. And we're finding that propane is also relatively a natural refrigerant because it's a naturally occurring compound. It's not a synthetic. Um, and it's got some performance characteristics um, that are really, really good for water heating, space heating, space cooling, and water heating. CO2 is really great for water heating. It's great on freezing, not so not so great on space heating. You've really got to work hard to kind of keep it within the, the range that will operate well in kind of these mid-temperature rises. In any case, um, the 134A, the 410A, those are refrigerants that we're, we're kind of trying to put in the past with these high GWPs. They're, they're you know, kind of synthetic blends. They're, they're not the greatest for the environment. As a matter of fact, I guess we should just say they're, they're really not good. And that's why we're trying to move away. But we have some really good options. And I have high hopes for propane. Just a quick little plug. Uh, Unfortunately, we can't use it in North America, US and Canada right now, but there's lots of people working on it. Propane, as we know, is, is a flammable refrigerant. There's lots of applications where we can take that flammable refrigerant with a really low GWP that has a really interesting um, uh, heat dome characteristic as you operate it as a refrigerant. Um, it'll work in cold ambience. It's a little more forgiving for return temperatures, which we'll look at. Uh, and we're really hopeful that uh, UL and ASHRAE and, and both federal governments involved will start a, creating a pathway where we can accept propane because the logic, you know, that's kind of keeping it out of the market right now is a little ridiculous when you consider the fear is that you're compressing a small amount of propane gas in a refrigeration cycle and gee, it might blow up or something a little bit like that, that 25 pound bottle of barbecue propane that we place outside of the desk, outside of the deck, or we pipe, pipe flammable gases into homes and light them on fire. You know, we can do all those things and we can certainly make uh, propane or R290 as a refrigerant work. It's quite a plug. Uh, it's quite a good refrigerant. Uh, and Europe has largely gone to propane. There's a lot of technology around it, a lot of products around it in Europe. But uh, right now, really one of the best ones that we can legally use and it's plenty, is uh, plentiful here in North America. There's more heat pumps coming online every year. ASHRAE, uh, the ASHRAE show this year showed more CO2 uh, refrigerant heat pumps, um, some large ones, really exciting stuff. Um, but the thing that, that we'll, we'll pause a minute and kind of talk about why CO2 is so good. CO2 is really good because you know, the refrigeration cycle is kind of like a phase change, right? We we take a gas and we compress it and it and it kind of turns into a kind of like a hot vapor and you know, maybe a liquid and and then we we kind of reverse it, send it around the cycle and kind of compress it, expand it, compress it, expand it. Uh, and that's how we kind of move the heat around. Uh, and and in hot water, in domestic hot water, you really need some high temperatures. And most of the ref current refrigerants really struggle with that. 
even R32, kind of the new low GWP refrigerant online, struggles to maintain 140 degree output temperature in most heat pumps that I'm seeing in, in kind of the colder ambience, right? It's warmer ambience is getting reliable, colder ambience, there's some periods where it just can't maintain it. And in domestic hot water systems, you really need some high output temperatures out of the heat pump. Well, the way that CO2 works is it's it's a little bit different. It's a very old, it's one of the original refrigerants, uh, kind of right next to ammonia and, and other uh, products in use. But when, CO, when you take CO2, and you look at kind of that left-hand graphic, when you compress it um, beyond the normal compression that you'd use in, in some of the blends, uh, you go from 600 PSI all the way up to 1400 PSI. What happens is it becomes compressed. It's very, very hot. Um, it, it's still a gas or a vapor, but it has kind of the energy density of a liquid. And so it's crossed a critical boundary and it's and it's taken on a super critical state. And the super critical state is kind of like, you know, you're still a hot vapor, but you have the energy density and, and you look a lot like a liquid, right? So there's been kind of a phase change. But because you're still really a vapor, you send it around and you pass that, that um, incredibly flexible state across a heat exchanger then there's no there's no kind of energy loss and in, in kind of going back excuse me through a phase change all that energy is available to just dump on <clears throat> whatever substance near it doesn't have all that energy intensity so the right hand graphic is is really a compression cycle where we um where we take the refrigerant start pumping it up and it takes on a very high temperature and as it takes that very high temperature, then we move it across basically a heat exchanger. But in this case, it's really kind of a gas cooler. And we drop all that heat onto a little pipe of water. So the blue line's a little pipe of water with water flowing in one direction and the hot vapor is flowing the other direction. And the energy just transfers super quickly because it's in that transcritical state and that energy is just available to move. So not that's a really unique state and that means that co2 can work in in ambient conditions that are really uh atypical sorry I kind of jumped ahead of slide here so uh we've worked a lot with this uh the kind of four and a half kilowatt sanco 2 heat pump um and this this scales across also kind of a a new uh mitsubishi qav or or uh, a transom uh, transcritical CO2 heat pump, right? They're all very similar because the refrigerant's really similar. And essentially what you get is things, is behavior that you would not get with 134A or 410A or, or R32. And, and essentially um, that third, on the left-hand side, that third bullet point down, a 3.1 COP at freezing is just amazing. It is just astounding. The output temperature on this device is a steady kind of 145 to 150 degree Fahrenheit. So we can store at high temperature, which means we have a lot more energy density in the storage volume. We're maintaining high temperatures to avoid Legionella issues. Um, and that we can do all of that in really cold ambience. And at 1.75 COP at minus 25 C, I've seen that uh, in kind of real time. We've done some projects way up in northern BC, a 12-hour drive above Vancouver, and uh, uh, hi to uh, the chat's gone, but uh, somebody from from uh, New France uh, joining us from Ontario, I think, that understands that, that climate. Uh, in any case, I watch that project every year, and every year that condition sees a minus 30 C. And we still see the heat pump running, making that full 145 to 150 degree Fahrenheit um, output temperature, and it works really well. There's not another refrigerant that really does that uh, this well. Propane gets close, but it's it's not really there. And so, so my point, and the, the reason I'm spending time on here, if we're talking about domestic water heating up and down the West Coast in any condition, CO2 is a really good refrigerant 
and will always perform, but it's got a challenge uh, and we'll look at the challenge here next. So um, and we'll, we'll take a quick pause and we'll have a little drink of water and see if there's any questions that uh, we need to address. And I don't see any, so we'll move right along. Okay, so uh, lots of heat pumps are coming to market right now. We're in a big transition point. Uh, when I started working with domestic hot water uh, in multifamily buildings, there were not a lot of options, and some of the options uh, would work really well in warmer climates, but they were a little bit rough in colder climates. And our uh, my experience in our company serves a whole range of climates, and so this is it's really pleasant to see all this transition. Uh, so lots of tools to start working with. We've had lots of experience and successful experience in decarbonization uh, on existing buildings and new constructions. The relationships are always really kind of the same. As we get farther into this, the building pictured is downtown Vancouver. It's actually my, our Canadian accountant is lodged in that building. And, and so every once in a while I can run in there and use the washroom and make sure there's hot water and everything's working right. Um, and it's And it's great. Building types are a little bit different, though. So in these large, older buildings, um, what we're learning these days is that our classic single pass design, which we'll look at here shortly using CO2 and primary storage and, and a swing tank or recirculation uh, or a, a way to manage recirculation losses, might not be the best thing. It certainly works um, in, in commercial office buildings, um, but it might not be there might be better systems, so we all have a little bit to learn and codes are starting to adapt and, and there's some more uh, discussions that we're going to have. Um, but essentially in buildings like this, we've got really big recirc loops and not very much load on the building, not, not actual water going out of the faucet and down the drain, uh, which means most of the energy loss or most of the consumption is recirculation loss, which CO2 can certainly handle, and there's ways that we can deploy that, but we're learning new technology um, that some of the uh, return to primary designs and maybe a little different refrigerant might also be an equally valuable tool. So it's an interesting time for all of this. Um, the single pass design is really good, and it's kind of the primary design for most climate zones for multifamily buildings, right? That that slide that we looked at first that had two peaks, high amplitude in the morning and then secondary, but a little bit wider in the afternoon, that works really well with CO2. CO2 is really well placed. So let's just take a look at basically how this works. Um, in this design, I've got to kind of move my little picture out of the way here so I can see as things move. Um, in this design, we have heat pumps and primary storage. The, the primary storage has got the has got the uh, stratified storage tank, so that's a cold water layer indicated with the blue uh, the blue shaded area at the bottom, and and so this is this is kind of the the CO two cycle. It really likes cold water in, uh, so we take cold water from the city. It passes through the bottom of the tank, maintains a cold water layer, and that cold water layer runs out to the heat pump through the piping crosses through the heat pump, gets lifted roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so we're starting at you know, 50 degrees, we get a 100 degree lift. So we're leaving around 100, 150 degrees and it gets pushed uh, back inside the tank. So imagine that's just a circle, right? We're taking cold water out of the bottom of the tank, running it through the heat pump and returning it to the top of the tank. And if there's no load on the building, that's a working circle. And that circle continues until we see warm water or hot water coming out of the bottom of the tank. And the hot water is kind of displaced that cold water stratification layer. And now we know that system is fully charged. And at that point, there's typically a sensor in place that will turn off the heat pump. And basically the tank will say, heat pumps, you can stand down and fully charged and away we go. The next thing we'll look at is 
we're going to give that hot water to the building. Now there's a load. So it's going to come out of the top of the tank and it'll start heading to the building and it'll go through uh, a mixing valve and head out to the building. But here's where a funny thing happens that's unique to CO2. This is, this is kind of our workaround. CO2 is just really, really good as long as we do this one thing. So here's a graphic. It's really simple. It basically says that CO2 heat pumps, all of them, really like cold water in. When you start giving them hot water, they really don't perform and funny things happen. They lose capacity and they're very, very unhappy. And we can see that because essentially that green line is the incoming water temperature into the heat pump. And it cruises along, it's nice and flat, steady, steady water. But you imagine, you know, as you kind of fill that tank up and in situations where that tank starts mixing because maybe there's a research loop and there's all sorts of things that'll cause a tank to mix. But once it starts mixing, we start elevating the temperature of the water going out to the heat pump and we can see that green line rise. As that green line rises and it hits kind of like the mid 80 degree Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius over on the left-hand margin, we can also see that the water flow rate starts rising up because essentially we've placed all this energy inside of that gas cooler. And now as the water is warming, and the water pump that's moving the gas, the water through the gas cooler, it's going from slow because it's just going to pause the water and let the water absorb the heat across the gas cooler. And then as the water temperature increases, it's, the pump's going to push it faster and faster because it's trying to maintain a, a steady output temperature of roughly 150 degrees, right? So as the water gets warmer and we still have all that hot vapor of the compressed refrigerant, then the only other choice we really have is we can slow down the compressor to kind of reduce that uh, temperature that we're putting into the cooler, or we can increase the water temperature and move it through. Um, and so at some point we exceed the capacity of the water pump to move it through. And, and at that point, then these, these heat pumps kind of work out of spec and essentially the blue line starts taking a big dive because that's the heat capacity or the total capacity of the unit. And so this is quite a common occurrence and this is kind of a workaround. And on the way, as that green line starts increasing, the water flow increases and the capacity uh, comes down, essentially that really tears up your coefficient of performance. You're still putting a lot of electricity into the heat pump. You're just not getting that much hot water out. You're losing capacity. And so it, it kind of starts degrading the heat pump. So that's the trick is always to maintain cold water into the heat pump. And so here's where we run into that with a real building. It's that little period right here uh, in this low amplitude. This this blue line is, is a, a, a graft a monitored building, multifamily building, an existing building that went through some studies. And essentially that recirculation loop is kind of like that, you know, 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. time period where everyone's gone to bed. There's no usage, which is kind of what happens after that, all those, all those big spikes. And when there's no usage, the research pump is just running and running and running. So we'd be pulling water out we'd be mixing it down across the mixing valve, sending it out through the research loop, losing maybe 10 degrees and then bringing it back. And if we bring it back directly into the primary in those periods and there's no load on the building, essentially we're gonna be reducing that tank and mixing up that tank. So that causes really a lot of problems and there's a really simple workaround. And the simple workaround is to put in a swing tank. We call it a swing tank, it's also called uh, recirculation management uh, or a temperature maintenance tank. And essentially the, the schematic now is, is we have primary storage. We size primary storage, deliver load of the building. It's a stratified tank. We give city water primary storage. City water runs through that cold stratification layer out to the heat pumps, gets lifted 100 degrees, drops into the top of the tank and goes down. Meanwhile, there's a load, any load comes out of the top of the primary storage tank and then heads over to that swing tank. 
drops into the swing tank at that full 145 or 150 degree is held there. And then when there's a research load or a load on the building, it goes out of that tank across the mixing valve, gets mixed down, heads out at 120 or 125 or whatever number that we decide to serve the building with, goes out to the building, some gets used, some always returns back through the research loop, and we bring it back to that tank. Now we've kind of closed that circuit. So we're not bringing any of that colder, but kind of warm water back to the primary tank. We're just maintaining it in that swing tank. And essentially what happens is that swing tank uh, will just, we call it a swing tank because the internal temperature will swing up and down. Here's what it actually looks like. There's that low overnight usage period. So that's when kind of the trouble would happen. And essentially there's no load on the building and we're, we're just piping water through that swing tank. And sooner or later, you know, we're pulling it out at one, 145, 140, mixing it down, setting it out at 120, losing 10 degrees, bringing it back. You do that long enough and you just wind up cooling that tank because you're giving the energy to the building basically through heat loss. And so in the next graph down, you can see that kind of pinkish line drop in temperature and a tank that started at 140 degree Fahrenheit will drop down to 125 degree Fahrenheit. And that represents the loss. So, so we typically place that swing tank, uh, we drop that, uh, we use an electric water heater. Oh, sorry, jumping ahead there. That swing tank design has usually six kilowatt, 12 kilowatt, 20 kilowatt, 30 kilowatt, whatever number we want to put in there, depending on the size of the building and what the loss is that we can calculate. And we'll put electric resistance. So what happens is as that starts cooling, we need to be able to serve the building with, a, with whatever temperature we want, 120, 125, or something like that. And if we start cooling below an acceptable point, the electric resistance heater will come on, charge it back up. It'll only come on for a very short period of time, though, because as soon as there's a load, right, as soon as we move it away from that low period use, uh, we'll start bringing in and flooding that swing tank with full 145 or 150 degree water, right? So we recharge the high temperature is there. Because the high temperature is there, the electric water heater or the electric resistance coils can shut off and everything is starting to run. And as there's load, there's a continual draw of full temperature water out of the primary storage. And the primary storage is free to maintain its stratification. And so as it maintains stratification, it's just going to run at those really nice high COPs across the building. So that's been recognized. That's kind of the current state of design. And, um, and there's been a whole lot of work kind of perfecting that design. And there's a few different ways that we can operate a sling tank. So now we're getting into basic uh, utility research and funded design research and really the output of that. And the output on the left-hand side is what we just talked about. We've got a system and it's a single pass system, which means we got kind of cold water going in on the left-hand side of that or right-hand side of that primary storage tank, stratification layer. We send that out across the heat pump, could be a single big heat pump or multiple small heat pumps or multiple big heat pumps, right? Just depends on what we're doing, but it's really all the same design. They lift, they put it into, they put the output into the top of the primary storage tank. As there's load, it leaves out of the top of the primary storage tank which is how we manage Legionella, right? We're maintaining a high temperature layer and quite a, quite a good volume there. So um, as, as the load goes through, water heading to residential usage is always passing through a high temperature zone, uh, which is kind of a, um, a, a way that we can manage that. It heads over to that temperature maintenance tank uh, and the temperature maintenance tank, in this case, has electric resistance, and it runs that cycle that we just talked about. Or another version of that is that we have um, 
another design that's identical on the left-hand side of the heat pump and primary storage relationship. On the right-hand side, we just use another heat pump. Instead of electric resistance, we've got a load that makes sense that we use a multi-pass heat pump. And the difference between a multi-pass heat pump and a single pass heat pump is a single pass is it'll take cold water in, do a hundred degree lift, drop it back or something there, a hundred degree lift, depending on the type of refrigerant and manufacturer. Um, and, uh, and essentially a multi-pass will do that same operation just in little bits, right? So it'll, it'll do a 10 degree lift or, or a number of lifts kind of always, always, uh, um, uh, always uh, kind of repeating that operation. So it just kind of, it takes warm water in, adds a little bit of temperature and lifts it back up. So that's uniquely uh, well qualified to run um, a parallel loop or a temperature maintenance uh, tank just with a heat pump. So you can increase your COP rather than electric resistance. And we've done a number of both designs. We'll take a look at a project here that's uh, a small project right here uh, where we've done that in uh, a new construction building in California uh, around Delano, so just kind of you know, a little bit north of Southern California. Uh, this is a new construction. It was originally scheduled to be a gas boiler, so we had quite uh, quite the challenge uh, and, and met the challenge, did really well, in working out a heat pump solution. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we can see we created a... a a heat pump solution, cold water comes in, gets lifted 100 degrees. It's a couple of these Sanco 2 heat pumps with some controls that we built on a rack. And, and this is in kind of mid construction, no uh, pipe insulation on it yet. And over on the right hand side, or, or the middle picture, is the primary storage tank. So there's a couple hundred gallons there. So cold water comes in, cold water layer, stratified. Uh, in that primary storage tank, goes out to the heat pump, gets a lift, and then heads back over into that uh, uh, unitary heat pump water heater. So uh, the unitary heat pump water heater is just operating as that swing tank. So theoretically, it only needs to operate in the wee hours of the morning uh, as the building's recirculation starts cooling that little, you know, 60 or 70 gallon volume, maybe, I don't think it's quite 80, um, uh, it'll start cooling that volume and then the heat pump will fire up. There's super interesting things. This, this project is data logged and we're all going to be learning more about how to use these unitary heat pumps or, or heat pumps in general to operate these temperature maintenance tags. It's fully data logged. And in another few months, I think we'll have our first year of data coming out of it. And we're just going to ask ourselves questions like, OK, you know, do we set it on hybrid mode? Um, can this particular heat pump handle the recovery or the um, uh, the recirculation losses just in, in by heat pump? Or do we need to also uh, use a little electric resistance? How efficient is that? Are we controlling it well? Um, it's going to be a really good uh, learning case. So any questions about uh, single pass design? How are we doing? Not seeing any hands up and not seeing anything in the chat. So I think we might be doing okay, hopefully. Okay. Well, um, we'll continue on. If anything comes up, please put your hand up or, or something in the chat and be happy to just kind of stop and talk about it. Uh, now let's look at sizing a building. There's really good tools, lots of stuff going on around here. Um, and it's happily changing quickly because five years ago, we really didn't have a lot of good tools. And what would happen is, you know, it would be kind of coming back to that practice of oversizing. And oversizing in a heat pump transition is not great. Um, there's, there's a couple of drawbacks to oversizing. One is the heat pumps can be really, really expensive. And the second is if you oversize the primary storage, like grossly oversize the primary storage, you could potentially build in a cold layer uh, of water in primary storage that doesn't really get used, consumed, and, um, and can kind of create uh, a, a, 
kind of a, a cooled area uh, that's right in the middle of the storage volume between cold and hot uh, that that is really a waste and 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 not useful um, you, you you find that out by actually monitoring buildings multiple multiple uh, temperature points and so forth so so right sizing right sizing is best um, and so the thing I'm happy about is there are lots of new calculators coming out. IATMO's got their, their, you know, kind of water flow calculator and the EcoSizer is now out and well vetted and going through some transitions, adding more building types onto it. In my opinion, for multifamily sizing right now, this is the tool. And the tool has been enhanced to take on um, additional uh, student housing and, and a number of other applications. Our team lives on this tool every day, uh, sizing buildings. It's free, it's publicly funded, uh, and it's accessible. All you gotta do is search EcoSizer, uh, and the address is right there. This will be shared, uh, the presentation shared, so you can, you can pull the address off if it's needed. And essentially when you go in, um, it just asks you a series of questions about your building. Questions are really simple. Uh, and so it starts with occupancy. And as it as it works through occupancy, we can we can work with people in apartments, or we can work with apartment size and occupancy rate. Just pick one; they both work. Um, but essentially, in this case, we can just start with uh, putting in fifty studios. The next line over, where it says occupancy rate, that's a drop down. So there's ash rate market rate. And the ash rate market rate yields a 1.49 occupancy rate. We could take it to California RSS or California um, uh, uh, low income. We could do an ash rate uh, uh, low income, or we could override it and we could put in our own occupancy rate if we really know what that is. Next thing over is peak gallons per day per user. So there's a number of choices there. Uh, and 25 is kind of that mid-range, really defensible uh, number in in some of the low-income housing in California. Um, those selections get bumped up to 30 gallons a day per person because we're assuming there's just more density in the uh, in the apartment than in the market rate. Um, but that's a slide. That blue button in the middle, right under 25, you can actually grab that with your cursor and slide it left and right and start inputting your own peak usage per gallon per day. So the tool is really flexible and it says it gives you a good kind of default position that's extremely defensible, but it also allows you to start playing with it because, um, you know, because there's lots of different buildings and lots of applications. So on the right-hand side, we're going to look at the plant and water temperatures. So we're design, uh, our design cold is incoming city water temperature. You know, in Fresno, that's going to be a completely different number than it is going to be in the Bay Area versus Eureka. Um, so we understand what that number is. We put in that number. Supply number is kind of what's leaving the mixing valve, right? So that could be 120. It could be 125. Um, I think the default coming out is 120, and then hot storage is really your heat pump. So if you're using a CO2 heat pump, you're going to be in the 150, or you could be in the 180 range. Um, if you're if you're using something that's um, different, well, you'll you'll find out what your storage number uh, is and pop that in. And then down at the bottom, there are um, different designs. So in you know, kind of highlight is that swing tank design, which is kind of where we live because we're CO2 single pass with a, a swing tank or a temperature maintenance tank. Next to it is a parallel loop tank, which essentially the same thing is just using a heat pump uh, rather than electric resistance, but you know, mostly the same. And then over on the right hand side is primary no recirculation. So primary no recirculation um, you'll, you know, there's someone using that application, they'll, they'll yield a different, um, they'll, the tool will give them a different output. There's really interesting things going on. And I, I will see a couple of slides 
about what's going on in warmer climates with primary no recirculation. And it's really all about, you know, kind of managing size, expense, and what the actual efficiency of the plan is. Um, and, and it's, you know, we're not in a one size fits all uh, environment right now. Whatever we do, swing tank, warm, warm climate, cold climate, that's a really, really dependable uh, and easy to size, size system. Uh, and so we generally, for our systems, we generally stay there. And, and essentially when we give it all that data, we can give it some more data. There's more data points we can get in there and you can spend some time and learn, learn about what those are. But it'll also give you kind of a picture of what the output and how this system will work based on the parameters that we've given it and assuming that it's a particular class of multifamily building, right? And so um, the useful storage volume is that green line at the top. And it kind of reflects a wider version of that first saw, slide that we saw of those couple of buildings in Seattle where there's a really high initial peak in the morning. But that initial peak, right, the, the top of that peak was really narrow, really high and really narrow. And this is kind of uh, working a little bit wider peak. We've got the amplitude, but we've got width, which means we've got more flexibility and essentially a little more backup. So essentially as the day runs in this top graph is the green is useful storage. So that's what we've got on storage. Um, the blue is hot water demand. So as people uh, wake up and the storage is at its peak, there's not really a lot of use, but as people start waking up uh, later in the morning, we can see that demand curve going up. And as the demand curve goes up, the green line goes down, right? So we're just living off of storage. The red line is, is the heat pump. So the heat pump, probably you can see that on the extreme left end, the heat pumps were running, you know, the line's right about a, a hundred. Um, and meanwhile, the green line is increasing in amplitude. And when the green line peaks, that's where the heat pumps shut off. The heat pumps shut off. The red line drops down to zero. The blue line, there's not much usage. Once there's usage, then essentially there's some controls. And the controls will say, okay, we've got usage going up. Now we're going to fire up the heat pumps, run them. We see we're running them well below what the amplitude and what the usage is, but we've got time, right? So then we just run them over time. The, the usage starts dropping down there in, the, in that midpoint. And then we can see as the usage going down, that the recovery or the output of the heat pumps is over what the actual usage is. And we just start rebuilding that storage peak. We re rebuild it up back to its maximum. It's the same as uh, the early morning uh, peak. And then the usage, the afternoon usage starts again. The afternoon usage is, is usually lower in amplitude, but longer in duration. And so we can see that 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 uh, the green line of available storage starts getting consumed, the heat pumps come back on, and the green line actually doesn't start dipping down towards zero again because we just, the building's not using that full available storage. And as the usage drops off, the blue line goes down, the heat pumps keep running, and the green line keeps kind of going up, and then it starts matching the left hand. Uh, and starts creating that next peak. And then we're just into a new daily cycle. So that's the heat pump and storage relationship and really kind of what we can expect. And you can output this right out of the EcoSizer software, right? So you can put in how many apartments you've got, what your characteristic, cold water in, what your storage temperature is, press the button, and it'll, it'll make this available to you. And the next page, we're gonna see some more information. But the next thing down is kind of how that swing tank works. So here's our opportunity to understand how the swing tank works. So the purple line is the swing tank temperature. This depends on the system, but this one starts at a little less than 130 degree uh, stored in the swing tank, right? So we, you know, maybe we, I don't know what the starting temperature is or what this system well, was 150. So maybe I kind of know, but we're starting a little less than 150. And as we start consuming water, the first water 
uh, consumed is out of the swing tank, but that hasn't happened yet. We can see that there's no load on the building if we look straight up at that blue line. So basically that loss in temperature is all recirculation loss. It's not load going down out somebody's faucet and down the drain. It's just heat loss across the recirculation loop. And it approaches 120, that turns on the electric resistance, kind of those gold lines in the circle. And the electric resistance comes on, reheats the water in the tank up to an acceptable level, which I guess is its set point, yeah, okay. And then turns off. Now, there's still no load, right? And it's a small tank and there's a continual research loss. So the research loss keeps going and going and going. The tank starts cooling. It hits the point where it turns on the electric resistance again. Electric resistance comes on, reheats. Um, but then at the end of that reheat period, there's load on the building. People start waking up. They start consuming water. It goes down the drain. And as it goes down to the drain, we start rebuilding and refilling um, the uh, swing tank just by uh, pulling new water in from the primary system. So that's what that looks like. That's the relationship of heat pump across load, across storage, and how we're managing the research losses. And you can see that those in this illustration, those the electric resistance isn't on very long. And it's on only to correct some losses that are really associated with lack of usage. Because if there was usage, the hot water would be uh, coming from uh, the heat pump plant. Good. Any questions? No hands, no comments. Uh, either you're all asleep or I'm decent at presenting what I'm trying to present. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take the decent path. Okay, so moving on. Let's start uh, looking at kind of specific California codes. Thanks for the thumbs up, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, let's take a different track. So we're kind of talking about the same things. Um, the last few years in California, there's been a lot learned, codes are changing, and we're we're kind of settling on, on Styles heat pump plants. And so um, this was a presentation that was done, you know, mid last year or something like that. Uh, really quite a good, uh, a good set of learning. And we'll, we'll go through a couple of slides, a couple of slides. So system performance and applications can vary by the primary uh, heat pump water heater equipment losses, single pass versus multi -path. pass. So on the right hand image, the single pass is at the top, multi pass is at the bottom. And you know, the, the, the chief differences there, single pass is cold water in, stratification layer out to the heat pump, one pass, 100 degree lift or something like that. In that case, it's going from 50 to 140. So it's a 90 degree lift single pass, 90 degree lift into the top of the tank. And as it goes into the top of the tank, it either goes into the tank or it goes out to the building. Uh, either way, just depending on what the load is. So multi-pass, uh, multi-pass heat pump. There's lots of them. That's a unitary heat pump, right? So the, the tall skinny ones that we can get at Home Depot or anywhere, um, those are multi-pass. And so essentially we get whatever temperature water coming in and and there's not really a stratification layer. We see some temperature differential. It's just kind of the way the, the volume stored. It goes out to the multi-pass heat pump, goes from 110, gets lifted 10 degrees, and then goes into the tank. It's, it's going back into the tank. And then as it goes back into the tank, it's not, it's not even at your service temperature yet. Well, it's just barely at your service temperature, right? So we're probably not gonna store at that temperature. So it's going to keep cycling, right? We're just going to take a, a little bit of water, run it through the heat pump, give it a 10 degree lift, give it to the tank, and then the tank will start mixing and settling. We'll get some more colder water down at the bottom, and then the colder water will go out to the heat pump, and then we keep going and going, right? So it passes through the heat pump multiple times, uh, same water in, in the storage until there's a load. And then once there's a load, it goes directly out, right? Because we're we're taking cold water out of the tank, giving it a, a multiple, a, giving it a small lift, and then putting it back in the tank. And essentially, if we started with a 
with a higher degree tank and we give it one cycle and it goes to 110 and then we start filling, filling that volume towards 110 and then our next shot is, well, we're gonna take 110 out, give it, turn it into 120. And then once we, once we create a 120 degree zone within the tank, then we'll take 120 out, give it a 10 degree lift, it'll show up at 130, et cetera, et cetera, until we heat that tank. That's why these unitary systems have a little bit of, um, you know, the unitary single family wa uh, hot water systems have that hybrid mode, which is a multi-pass heat pump where we're lifting and lifting and lifting, uh, but it also has a strip of electric resistance in periods, I've got to have water now, I can't wait for it to go through all those passes, so I'll turn on the electric resistance, give it an extra zap of energy and try to get my stored temperature up quickly uh, during times of load. So the coefficient of production in a single pass, you're essentially taking cold water, running it through a heat pump with a really super great refrigerant that just you just run a compressor, you compress the refrigerant, you run a water pump, and then you run a fan. You know, that's pretty much it. Maybe a PCB board. Doesn't take a lot of energy to do that because the refrigerant's really doing most of the work. Multipass has a lot of electricity running that water through there multiple times. So you generally don't get the efficiency out of a multipass, but where multipass works best is where the incoming water is kind of warm, southern climates, and where the ambient air temperature is kind of warm, southern climates. So it wouldn't work so great in northern climates, but in southern climates, it's it's decent, right? And, and we're learning more. So recirculation loops, once we add those in, this is kind of pretty much what we talked about. So on the left-hand side, classic single pass design, heat pumps could be multiple heat pumps, primary storage is stratified, cold water comes in from the city, little branch of cold water goes up to the mixing valve, Output of the heat pump uh, goes into primary storage. Then the output is available to come out of primary storage into the swing tank. Swing tank's got electric uh, resistance in it. And, and if it gets too cool, the electric resistance turns on, warms it back up, and off to the building you go. And you bring your hot water return back from the building through the recirculation pump back into the bottom of that swing tank or temperature maintenance tank. On the right-hand side, primary heating system, same design, just using the multi-pass. And really kind of the point here is that these designs are recognized, right? These are, are designs that you can pull, deploy into buildings, and they're, they're really kind of code and industry recognized now. Didn't used to be, but they are now. So temperature maintenance system returned to primary. There's one more slide that'll kind of bring all this information together. But essentially what happens in this configuration is we're returned to primary and we're gonna see kind of what happens with that. So everything's the same. It's just, we have no swing tank or temperature maintenance tank. Cold water comes in across the stratified layer, goes out to the single pass heat pump, gets lifted, could be multiple heat pumps back into the storage tank and the storage tank will give it to the mixing valve and the, the recirculation return comes back from the top through the pump and into the lower level of the primary storage. And so we can see there's three temperature gradients within that tank. There's kind of the cold layer at the bottom, which is always governed by how much usage there is. And that can increase as we use more. And then it takes more time to kind of rebuild uh, or reduce that cold layer. Then there's kind of that orangey layer, which is essentially what you get. You get water leaving the primary storage, going across a mixing valve, gets mixed down to 120, goes out to the building, comes back around 110, and then mixes in with that cold water layer at the bottom. So of course, it starts kind of stirring the tank and 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 keeping a, a kind of a mid-level uh, layer, but at some point that mid-level layer starts mixing with the blue layer, and um, and we start getting some warmer uh, warmer water showing up to the heat pumps. We'll see what that actually looks like. And then the red layer is just kind of that that high temperature maintenance layer. The funny thing about tanks and temperature layers is uh, hot to cold is really abrupt. 
So it very quickly goes from a high temperature down to a cold temperature. It's not a long mixing point. It happens really quickly, like, you know, less than an inch or, or around an inch. Um, so on the right-hand side, same thing, return to primary in a multi-pass. So multi-pass is a little bit different, right? The, the heat pump's not going to be so dependent on receiving that cold water. So it might work a little bit better. And here's really the results based on looking at lots of buildings and different um, different heat pump configurations. So that, that uh, CO2 on the left-hand side, single pass in series for a temperature maintenance tank, 3.91. And that's a real number. We've got a project in Fresno. It's all data logged. Um, it's a big skid. We might see a picture of it. And our initial numbers coming out of the heat pump plant relationship to primary storage is like 4.46 uh, COP. It is amazing. That's a big, big number. And so 3.91 is really defensible. 3.85 is really defensible. Also, those are really good efficiency numbers. Uh, affects your connected load, how much, how much energy the system is using. And of course, then that swing tank is there to kind of maintain that relationship by giving, giving the heat pumps always cold water. In the next series over, single pass in 134A, it's a little, you know, it's two and a half. Don't know the ambient temperatures and so forth, but we don't really get those COPs with that system because it's, you know, it's, it's a little different multi-pass on the right-hand side of that 134A multi-pass return to primary is 2.12, which in single family unitary stuff, you know, 2.12 is pretty good. Um, it's a heck of a lot better than 0.86 that we get out of a gas water heater. Um, but, you know, we really want to kind of keep designs and we're looking for better results up at 3.91. But as we get into different buildings or remodels, there's other limitations we run into. So this is really useful. And sometimes in a building, we'll look at a building and we'll say, you know, two and a half is going to be great for this building in this environment. And then 410A, you know, 134 and 410A on the right-hand side, um, you know, that refrigerant's kind of on its way out right now. Um, but that's really the maximum that we can get it to perform. So CO2, we can see has really high COP and the other classic refrigerants that we have available to us right now don't really have, in the best conditions, they don't have that high COP available. And then we can see uh, a, uh, a note on the right-hand side, NIA tier three system COP equals 2.5 for most, most California climate zones. We'll look at that in a minute. So, um, oh, and, and those of you that know California better than I do will note that that is all a study in climate zone 12. Okay, so code requirements have been for Title 24, uh, allows both single pass and multi-pass multi for primary equipment, requires recirculation loop, decoupled from primary heat pump water heater systems. So temperature maintenance tank is the way we just uh, decouple it or a swing tank. Planning configurations to ensure stratification, right? So it's a four port tank rather than um, anything less than four ports, cold water coming in on one side, creating the boundary layer and going out the other side out to the heat pumps and coming back. Control requirements to achieve minimal efficiency. There's a lot to talk about there, but we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, and then some performance requirements. Last year, they drafted code language. I think this might have all passed right now and is um, it is actually heading to 2024 or 25 code. Um, sorry, I'm not as up as I'd like to be. Uh, no more multi-pass because it just doesn't have the COP. So, so code is kind of single pass primary. Um, it's going to require recirculation loop decoupled. And then note B is a system that meets a requirement of NIA, Advanced Water Heating Specification. Let's remember that for commercial heat pump water heater system tier three or higher, supposed to be an R there, will also meet that proposed code. So that document exists and we'll look at that document and it's publicly accessible. So as we're, as we're starting to work on um, heat pump water heaters, 
then now, you know, these days we've got tools. When we started this, we didn't have any tools. There was no qualified product list. Uh, all the work had gone into single family and, and we're just starting work with multifamily. So um, the web address is right there at the bottom. You'll get a copy of the presentation. It's searchable NIA central heat pump water heater qualified product list, which is different than the single family qualified product list. This is just, this is commercial plants or central heat pump water heater plants. I of course snipped our products out and put them on the right hand side, but there's a whole bunch of products from a whole bunch of manufacturers now. They just updated list list. Uh, three months ago, the list had a few items on it. Ours were really the first, so we had a number of items on it. Uh, now, they, the industry and NIA and, and a number of stakeholders have done a lot of work qualifying a lot of products. And essentially, um, it's a big list now. And if it's on this list, it's code compliant in California, as long as it's tier three or higher. So you log on a list, start understanding kind of what tier three is. I should have kind of clipped out the headings and, but essentially what you're seeing there is different climate zones and different tiers um, within those climate zones and California will fall into a particular climate zone. And what the total system COP uh, is expected within that climate zone. And uh, I think that first one is kind of like a hot climate zone. And I'm seeing our products at 2.7 um, and 2.7 is the highest COP that's listed on the NEA qualified products list. And then you remember two slides ago, we saw something um, at roughly 3.9 or something like that. This is total system COP. So it includes all the pumps, the swing tank, all the loads all in. Um, and, and so that 2.7 is a real number. And essentially what's gonna happen with this list next is this list will be available to utilities uh, all over the country or countries, and uh, they can start applying some rebate programs because essentially you're going to save a whole lot of kilowatt hours with a heat pump, especially a really well-performing one compared to electric resistance. And so the utility, we hope, is going to start making some of those savings available to buy down the cost of transitioning into central heat pump water heaters. So lots of knowledge. List is there. You can go to the page. You can go to the list. It's ever changing um, and lots of good things happen. If, if it's not the prescriptive path, um, I'm not super good at this, but this is on our website and there's a little movie um, and we had a, a, part, a, a partner make a little movie presentation that uh, they graciously allowed us to put it on uh, our website. And essentially it's a little movie saying, okay, I'm gonna make a heat central heat pump water heater. It's not on the qualified product list or for whatever reason. So I'm gonna model it. And these are the steps to actually model the central heat pump water heater within the Title 24 software. It's not really that difficult. Um, and it's really part of the important part is whatever heat pump you're using is actually in the CBEC software as a selectable item. Um, and I would imagine that's continually updated. So more is kind of going on there. So um, there's the proposed codes change. I think we're there. I don't think anything shot down, but I, I can't say I'm the expert at it right now. But 2022, that was the allowable. There's the 2025 primary path. And the alternative path is you select a product on the NIA Advanced Water Heating Commercial a uh, heat pump water heater tier three or higher, and it is compliant. Uh, so you got single pass there, you got multi-pass there because all you edit it, if it's on the list, you can go. And if not, then you've got to model it and 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 you know work out the ways to comply. Uh, totally doable. Some things will work, some things won't work. It's really all about COP. Um, and there's a new thing coming up called demand response or load shift, which is really um, super important. It's ex personally really exciting to me. Um, and I'm sure um, many people are very, very familiar with it, maybe more so than I am. 
But essentially, uh, this is now in uh, a code requirement uh, for me here in Washington State for residential systems. It's becoming a code requirement in California for central heat pump water heaters. Right now, it's a way that you can get additional funding through S-CHIP, which is kind of down there at the bottom of that slide, self-generation incentive program. And essentially, here's what happens. A central heat pump water heater in a building is going to store anywhere from 200 gallons to 2,000 gallons. Sure, that's going to be an average. That'll cover a lot of multifamily buildings. So that's all stored energy, right? We're storing at roughly 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we're using electricity to make that temperature. It's a battery. And California's got a really good future, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in understanding kind of how to match renewables with load. And this is how we're matching renewables with load. And our company is really, really involved in this. We, we find it exciting. We've got plants uh, out in the world that are doing this. And essentially, you know, you've got that peak. You've got that system with the two peaks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, right? And so you're serving it with stored, uh, stored water. And you can kind of make that water anytime if you have enough storage. So you kind of change your calculation a little bit and you say, okay, how much storage do I need to not run my heat pumps during you know, the time that California would rather not, uh, that California would like to deploy load shifting, which is four to 9 p.m. So we start modeling and we start creating scenarios where we can build up enough storage and ride through these, these shed periods all on storage without running the heat pumps. And then we're outside of that, that shed period, and then we can turn the heat pumps back on and rebuild storage. So, so this is a relationship between heat pump recovery and storage, what the utility wants, and what the building load is. And so there's been a whole lot of work in developing the software within the Ecosizer to say, okay, in a single pass design, in this application, here's a load shift uh, here's a load shift plan. It's a really, really simple plan from a sizing standpoint. So from a sizing standpoint, there's three temperature measurement points uh, and they're listed there as aquastat fraction and there's an on trigger. And then next to that, there's an off trigger. And then there's heat pump water heater output. So we know kind of the relationship between the triggers and kind of what the heat pumps produce. So you think about that storage tank on the left, that's a picture of our new storage tanks. We put four thermistors vertically in each storage tank where most heat, most storage tanks just have one. With one, you can't really measure anything other than the one point that you're measuring. And on the left-hand side of that aquastat fraction, we're saying, eh, it kind of wants to know what the temperature is at 40% of the fraction, also at 10% of the fraction, and then 85% of the fraction. And if we look to the left of that 85, it says shed. And essentially what it's saying is, if that tank is 85% full, based on some other criteria that we've created around storage and load, we can go into a shed period. And a shed period is, let's run through this period of time just on storage. And, and if we're in that period, then we can run a program that says, hey, heat pumps, don't turn on, we're in a shed period. And by the way, you know, if you wind up getting to, to that middle section of load up, well, all bets are off, turn the heat pumps back on because we got to give the occupants hot water, right? So this is kind of the calculation. On our side, we've developed controls and, and ways of, of kind of looking at the sizing, matching our control data points and our equipment data points by adding these thermistors in it. And, and you know, most systems don't just use one tank, they'll use multiple tanks. And so when we start looking at multiple tanks in larger systems, and we each, each of our tanks has four thermistor potentials, we can start mapping out and say, okay, that's really one really tall tank. So let's make three or four thermistors active in there, one at the bottom, to show that we've got all, you know, that we've charged from the top all the way down to the bottom, or we're seeing hot water down to the bottom. So we know the thing's full. One halfway, 
for kind of a normal operation because normally they're about in the middle or so. And then one at the very top to say, oh, you know, it's we got a lot of cold water in these tanks. We need to fire those heat pumps, right? So, so we can manipulate, we can place thermistors and we can understand kind of what the tank condition or if we go all in and say, hey, we're going to buy every thermistor on the planet and put it in one of those tank ports, now we actually got a real thermal battery and we can build controls that really understand at a very high degree what the state of charge across that whole system is. Because the other thing that we can do is once we start getting good at this demand response, it's kind of an exciting future, is we can start buying energy when it's cheapest, right? So demand response is kind of all about the utility saying, hey, we got too much load, don't run your heat pumps. But but if you're a consumer of energy, it's also about, huh, how much storage they got? What's my condition? Should, you know, here's the cost of energy now. Should I buy now or should I wait till later? Because I can look at the cost on a 24 hour cycle and start making some assumptions. So that's kind of the world we're heading in. Uh, we haven't accomplished um, time of use pricing yet, but it's kind of in our work. Others will, and it's super exciting. So anything uh, else about the codes? I got to make sure I'm not running us out of time here. Okay, I got to keep moving. On we go. Okay, so um, how do we actually put these things in the fuel? We've come from a world of site-built plants. And we've recognized some challenges about site-built plants. So um, this is a system in a brand new multifamily building in Vancouver. It's up and running. It works great. It was, uh, it was a design. There's a controller. There's heat pumps. There's tanks. Uh, and we give it all to an installer. They put it in. And then we show up on site with a nice smiley fellow named Anas in the vest and he starts it up and says, yes, it's working well, or no, you got to move this pipe here or change this control piece. So that's a lot, right? If we're thinking about moving buildings at a large scale from gas to electric heat pumps, and these heat pumps, we spent a lot of time talking about the relationships and how important they're piping and what you can do, what you can't do and where we're heading, it's a lot. And so building these things at site requires we need to train all the engineers how to size, how to design, uh, how to inspect. Building inspectors have to understand how to inspect. Architecture has to understand that, you know, here's how much space we need and you can't put it in a little closet like we used to in a little mechanical room. Um, and then the installers have to be able to install it. Uh, and somebody has got to do some QC. The major components, no matter the size or the manufacturer, I guess in site built up systems are the same. It's a heat pump, it's a control, it's one or multiple storage tanks. In a single pass temperature maintenance design, there's a temperature maintenance tank. And that diffuser is in this picture just because we wanna channel the cold water towards the bottom and separate it from the hot water. So, you know, okay, there you go. Um, or we could, very exciting fellow, uh, we could put them all in a box and lift the box up and put it on the roof. All the tanks are in, all the heat pumps are on, all the controls are done, and we connect three water pipes, one power landing, boom, you got a water heater. This is where the, where the policy end of life would like to go because there's less risk and and there's less engineering requirement, there's less training, we can manage this change faster, right? So there's there's a lot of incentive to do that. So now we're gonna start looking at kind of what we do and what others are doing. We're, we're a little bit of the tip of the spear here. So um, as we go, you know, if we did this a year later, there'd be a number of other people probably doing this, um, which is setting up a factory to build package systems where, Everything's done. It's all in a box. You bring the box. Maybe it's one box. Maybe it's two boxes. Maybe it's three boxes. You bring the box to site. You plug it in. You hook the water, and you start stand back and let it let it do its job, which can be done in a day, two days, pretty quick. So for um, for us, we set up a little factory and a new build. Um, we used. Um, 
uh, my friend that I respect highly, Ken Eklund, who was at the beginning of the presentation, the guy that really kind of worked on CO2 in North America the first, named the factory after him. It's an innovation center. And we set out uh, to start designing systems and create a number of systems, establish all the pipings, all the relationship, how much expansion, where the measurement points are, uh, make it craneable so it'll it'll lift up on top of a building. It'll go on a flatbed trailer and ship. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is one of the early ones. Um, it's a steel frame, full seismic value. Uh, this is for a little building. It's not a super big building. That's a 285-gallon tank in the back. That's the temperature maintenance tank, that Bach electric. Uh, on the back side, you can see all the heat pumps. And it's all piped. It's all done. There's a mixing valve. There's a recirculation pump. There's a controller that's got super smart. And these days it can do demand response and kind of the whole nine yards. And you just pick it up, set it down, screw it down to a building, and away you go. Here's all the components. Um, if it's an external, we want a place, you know, we're all about um we're all about building efficiency, certainly at our company. So we wouldn't put this out in the weather exposed. So we build a steel frame, we wrap it in an R8 rigid enclosure uh, to contain, uh, you know, to kind of reduce the heat loss. Mount all the tanks, make it all craneable, mixing valves there, expansion tanks there, the building connections are at the bottom left-hand part of the picture, the heat pumps are kind of hanging off the back, they're all ganged together, the controller's up there, um, everything is there. And we can we can just give that water and electricity, turn it on, and it literally is like a big water heater for a multifamily building. Here's one deployed uh, in California on a rooftop. This is uh, at startup stage for us, so we're just you know kind of giving it water, bleeding out some air out of the heat pumps, and it's first startup. It takes a day maybe to start up a plant like this. These are actually two boxes because. Um, it's a bigger building and so we want more storage. So we put in, in the left-hand side, it's got heat pumps across the back that we'll see. It's got the power panel there on the left-hand side, left of the door. Um, and then in that middle panel, um, uh, it's got room for a storage tank and then another storage tank. And then in that next box over, it's got another storage tank and then the middle panel with the yellow sticker on it has got the electric swing tank on it right and it's got three phase power connections so it's got the yellow sticker that panel is all removable you pull the panel off you get full access to the wiring and all that kind of stuff and then uh inside that door that you can kind of see the controller the recirculation pump the mixing valve all of that so that's where that's where we can actually start managing this transition very quickly so the job now is understand the building understand the load do a sizing and then go to a catalog and say here's the water heater that i need it's co2 it's single pass it's got this much storage it's got this much recovery and here's the space and the weight and boom, there's my water heater. So in, in some buildings, we can approach it with one really big plant uh, with a common uh, recirculation loop or distribution loop, or we can start zoning that building out. It's, you know, it's, it's up to the engineer. Everyone's got their preference. It's easier to design a single zone because that's what everyone's done. But when we start looking at pump energy and pipe diameters and heat loss, Taking a larger building and carving up zones, in this case, this is a rather large building, and those are a water heater on the left and a water heater on the right. Those are up, running, working. Um, there's a pair doing full demand response, all of that. And basically, that's serving a vertical zone. So we come out of that water heater, we dive straight into the building. It's a vertical relationship with a little bit of left and right serving, you know, 160 uh occupants or something like that at a at a piece it's not a super big zone but when we start looking at the pipe diameters and and the the pump energy it all starts getting smaller and as you reduce pipe diameter this is why um there's a whole lot of work around the iatmo uh pipe calculators right because it's all about reducing pipe size 
Because if you reduce that circumference, you reduce heat loss, right? There's less surface area. You can add a little more uh, insulation and, and it's not too hard to pump water through that because these values are all known. So super strong arguments for both, but you know, buildings are all different and companies are starting to make a catalog of water heaters going from, you know, the way you grade them is how much storage, because as you size a building, it'll say, oh, this building needs 500 gallons of storage and it needs 92 kBTU an hour in uh, recovery to rebuild that storage based on the curves that we see. And it's got to have a swing tank and all of that stuff. And so that's that middle line, right? It's 500 gallons of storage and 92 kBTU. You need a little more of one, a little more of the other. You just got to start uh, working between the lines and, and sizing your equipment. Or there's other ways to do it. Um, other ways to do it and other building types is not all buildings are friendly for a big old box. So we're recognizing as a company and as a policy uh, group of policyholders, as the as uh, uh, incentives are developed, um, there's more room to not deliver in one box, but still get all the incentives. Because part of the part of the logic behind this incentive in incentivizing these packages are, I can assure you, not everyone knows how to design these systems. Not everyone knows how to install these systems and serious mistakes happen. And the system won't run at that 3.9, 2.7, or whatever that planned COP is because mistakes happen. And mistakes, basically, either there's water on the floor or there's just a lot of energy use with little yield of, of energy out in the form of domestic hot water. And the way, you know, the way if you if you can't teach everybody in a short period of time. As a utility, it's kind of like, okay, let's get behind some products that are produced at a factory that reduces our risk. So if we say we're going to incentivize a savings of X number of kilowatt hours on a building compared to electric resistance and that X number of kilowatt hours savings essentially means you're assuming a certain COP. And if it's a package, it's all made in a, in a, in a plant. And, and it's pre-engineered and pre-manufactured and delivered and started up, it's pretty reliable that we're going to get that savings. If it's a design one-up fresh piece of paper with a new installer, it's not really certain that we're going to get that savings. So, so, so we're heading to an environment, whether it's our company or other companies, is of packages and really intelligent systems. And, and so... In cases like this one, this is the building we looked at earlier, heat pumps are outside, tanks are inside. Um, that's the only way we could have done this building. So we've created kind of a whole range of products and heat pump products to accomplish that. Uh, and then these, um, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's actually 12 of these small Sanco 2s gang together. That will do 180,000 kPTU an hour which is a lot. And then you can gang more of these together with just a simple LAN plug, right? You can set two or three of these next to each other, pipe them over to storage, and each, each one's got a box like this. And you can see on the right-hand picture, on the, on the right-hand side of that panel, there's that little black dot with a cover. And that's basically a LAN port. So you can park two of them, pipe them up, head the piping to storage, give power to that panel, and it's the controls in there, demand response, all that stuff's in there. And then you can daisy chain them together with a LAN cable and just make them all work together. And one's the lead and the others follow the lead. And that's how the system works. Um, this is actually being produced for a, a, um, a very special building in downtown Vancouver, BC. That's a partnership with the city of Vienna, Austria to create um, some uh, a special type of social housing that's common in Austria. Um, and um, so it's it's a pretty cool project. And the nature of this project was to separate the heat pumps away from the primary storage. It wasn't friendly to put a, a standard system on top. Uh, and so we've created actually three of these droplet six, we call them, they daisy chain together. They take from a single source of the cold water through the tanks and then give uh, to a single point of hot water and then a swing tank and all of that stuff. 
And in this circumstance, you can see basically there's access to the controls and an on off switch. And then in the open panel, there's breakers so we can shut off all the individual things and then pull lots of data and do lots of things. And so there's a range of those and they'll they'll range from a small system with 31,000 kbtu all the way up to 185 and then we can chain any number of these together uh and they're pre-built and they just drop on top of a building plug in and give them power and water and away we go so big buildings um and uh thanks david you gave me a question i'm going to finish this slide and i'm going to come back to your question um, so big buildings, yeah, it was kind of what we talked about earlier, large, large complexes. Um, this is a project we did in Northern California. It's a meta building, new construction for, for housing right around meta, you know, Facebook kind of, uh, headquarters. And, um, and so the configuration is, uh, lots of vertical zones and water heaters serving those zones, super simple design very, very efficient building and easy to set up and lay out. Or, you know, there's other ways we could do it. If we want to serve one big zone, then there's ways to serve one big zone. Um, we just kind of pick a plan and uh, look at that. We're actually at the question slide. So David Wilson, beyond TOU electricity for demand management, do you ever see dynamic hourly electricity rates for DHW or only for electric battery storage? Oh, I absolutely see dynamic rates. Uh, so I think that's where we're heading. I think that's where our company is heading. That probably where other companies are heading right now. Um, so, you know, there's a few things going on there. One is we we have to, when we approach the building, we have to kind of know what we're doing. And then it's going to be all about building enough storage, right? Because storage, with more storage, you can, you can manipulate the heat pumps more because you can run them when you want it. You can run, for us, we use multiple heat pumps. So we can run a few, we can run half of them, we can run all of them, or anything in between, because we can we can control all of that. Uh, and they're very, very efficient. So then if we match that up with big storage, then we can say, okay, we understand the load, we understand kind of what our storage characteristics, then we can start building some understanding in and kind of what future energy rates are. And right now there's a site, I haven't I haven't gone on it, um, but it'll broadcast um, utility rates to you, to your equipment. So uh, in 24 hour cycles. And, and so you can start understanding what the future pricing cycles are. And because you know your building, you can start understanding what the future load characteristics are. And now you can start manipulating that and, and create some uh, some programming that will help you buy. It'll, that's what we think. We haven't done it yet, but that's what we'd like to do next. Um, and because it's all about storage, storage becomes really important. And there's a lot of work going on. We were pretty advanced in moving our primary storage from big tanks of water to latent energy storage. And in latent energy storage, you can store all of the energy in half the physical volume, um, which means now you can build more, right? You can you can build more storage in or more storage capacity. Um, there's there's a lot of work to do around that, but it's a really really bright future. And so, you know, ten years ago, water heating was like, okay, I got a pipe of gas and I got this I got this flame and. And I light it on fire, I need more energy, I bring more gas, I make a bigger flame, and you know, away I go. I need water, I turn it on, and I make hot water. And nowadays, we're creating really manageable batteries. And, and we're really excited to actually work with policy and utility to understand how we can make some really, really interesting products, right? Because who wants to just sit around saying, hey, I got a pipe of gas and I can light it on fire? You know, that's not, that's not really 
super exciting to a, a person like me, but that might just be me. Um, so in answer to your question, yeah, I, I think there's a lot we can do. And our view is to treat these as big batteries. And as it gets more interesting, if you really kind of think about it, the conflicts show up um, when we do retrofit buildings and they want to transition from gas water heating. They also want to add, uh, they want to change to a heat pump for heating and cooling of the building space. And they want to add car charging, right? These are all these are all new loads. So the question is kind of like, okay, what's the panel capacity? What's the load characteristic? And can we now start inventing ways to, and can we work with utilities? Because there's some really big questions behind this. Can we work with some utilities to say, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna heat water here, we're gonna, we're gonna leave this open for car charging, and we'll do some space heating and cooling, do we develop more storage for cooling and ride some periods with cooling or, or you know, there's a lot of relationships there, or do we kind of create this menu and, and we just watch the demand and we create level capacity based on realistic uh, capacity restrictions. And then we just start managing these loads in really new creative ways. Really exciting. I, you know, I, I wish I was 20 years younger so I could do this a bit longer. Um, my wife would probably disagree with that, um, but because uh, we got a life, um, but it, it's super interesting stuff. So with that, um, I think we're just about at time, aren't we? You might be muted. Yes, I think so. We have, okay. I think we're up till 11. Um, Good. Okay, good. Yeah, we're not excited. So yeah, so if folks have any more questions, opening the floor. Good. Oh, thanks for the positive comment there, Jennifer. I don't see any questions coming in, but maybe I could do the closing slides and then we could come back to two more questions. That sounds great. All right. Uh, here's, a, here's a slide for you. Awesome. So just a reminder, we have our Code Coach service for anybody who has any Title 24 questions. There's an online, um, an online page where you could go and submit that. And there's also a phone number. So uh, I'll provide that link soon in the chat box. Next slide, please. And just a little bit of what's coming. So if you have any questions regarding AIA or ICC learning units, we have those available for today's class. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat. So Send me an email if you have any questions about that. Happy to help with that. If you didn't submit your number, coming to you are the slides and the recording for this for this uh, training today. And just a couple of our trainings coming up in the next couple of days. And I will also put the calendar in the chat if you want to look into those descriptions more in depth. But thank you again, Albert, for such a awesome training. I feel like I learned a lot too. And thank you everybody for, for tuning in. It's always great to have such a, a good room of people so engaged. Well, yeah, thank you everyone. Um, 
And yeah, I hope it was useful and happy to do it. Um, and boy, everybody gets an unplanned 20 minutes back. That's <laughs> not a bad thing. Okay, there's a question. Thank you, uh, Tatiana. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on how to interface with the water drop and the plumbing engineer for piping size? Um, I think so. We have we have a a team that kind of helps with that. Um, we have full specifications on our equipment. They'll show um, pipe diameters kind of coming out of the equipment. And then we'd be happy to, to I guess, uh, talk to the engineer um, about what the recirculation loop is and kind of what's going on there. I do say that uh, our submittals are based on, on kind of a, you know, a completed product. Here's your water heater for the full skid approach. And it contains a recirculation pump and an electronic mixing valve. Um, and the recirculation pump is ECM control because that those those little factors relate back to our controller because we're we're trying to kind of understand the condition and and um and ECM, those that equipment's really friendly with that. Um, but it's it's a specifiable part. So the engineer could say, okay, here's here's my characteristic and and you know kind of here's the head of the system and and the, what the rest of the building is. And then we can work with them on um, on understanding your recirculation pump and whether it's kind of the right size, the ones we use, turn down a lot. And that leads into kind of a pipe diameter uh, discussion. If, if they're unused to kind of trying to minimize pipe diameters, then we can kind of point out the new IATMO calculators, uh, which are pretty new, uh, and help with that a little bit. Um, but I have to say, our, our primary knowledge is how to make the water hot, and we don't spend a lot of time in, in designing the distribution system, so I can't claim that we're super, super knowledgeable or helpful in designing the distribution system. So hopefully that's helpful. Awesome. I don't think I see any more questions coming in. All righty, everybody. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Oliver. Um, you guys will be getting these slides in the recording very soon. And have a good rest of your day. Bye. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.